Good evening. My name is Allison Kaplan. I'm Director of Education at the National First Ladies Library, located at the National First Ladies Historic Site in Canton, Ohio. I want to thank everyone who is joining us, whether you're joining us tonight um, as we're live, or if you're tuning in later, uh, the National First Ladies Library offers a number of uh, programs um, from lectures, from scholars, to um, our educational teach talk programs and our Fun with Flotus children's program. And all of those are accessible on our YouTube page. Um, I want to mention one upcoming program on October 25th. We're offering a virtual program geared to students, um, grades four through eight at 10 a.m. Um, we will be hosting um, Marilyn Singer, the author of the book, Have You Heard About Lady Bird? So um, our workshop today is geared towards helping teachers create curriculum around that presentation. Um, Marilyn has crafted a number of um, bio poems inspired by First Ladies. We're really excited to have her along with Nancy Carpenter, the illustrator of the book. So we're hoping that this will add um, some creativity to your classroom. Um, if you have not registered for the program, whether you watch it with your students live or you watch it later, um, every teacher who registers for the program, as well as this program, receives a free book. Um, and we have a number of special um, teaching packages too that we're giving away to teachers with a number of other books and um, magnetic poetry prompts and um, all sorts of books like this one um, geared to learning about women in history through poetry. So um, as I am not the expert on poetry this evening, we are very excited to have a speaker from the Wick Poetry Center at Kent State. Um, Charles Malone is a North East Ohio native who earned his bachelor's and master's from Kent State before working on his MFA at Colorado State University. While in Colorado, Charlie taught poetry in the schools with literacy through poetry and served on the staff of the Colorado Review and Matter Journal. In collaboration with Wolverine Farm Publishing, Charlie edited the, the anthology A Poetic Inventory of Rocky Mountain National Park. His writing has appeared in Salfront, Sugar House Review, Phoebe, Harper Palette, The Laurel Review, Bone Shaker, and Permafrost. He is also the author of the chapbook Questions About Circulation from Driftwood Press and the full-length collection Working from Hypothesis from Finishing Line Press. So we're really excited to have Charlie here this evening. I'm going to turn things over to him and then um, I'll reappear at the end and um, ask Charlie some questions. If you have questions for Charlie, feel free to enter them in the chat. Um, and we'll include some links in the chat to some upcoming programs and some of the curriculum. So thank you so much for joining us. And I'm gonna turn it over to Charlie. Great, thank you, Allison. I'll bring up my presentation here really quickly. Okay, so before I get started, I should say a few words about the Wick family. None of the work that we do at the Poetry Center would be possible without their support. They endowed our center as a way of healing from the loss of two sons who had passed away uh, in car accidents seven years apart on the same way. And they've empowered us to find ways to put poetry to work in our communities, to have healing conversations, to encourage new voices, and to do collaborations like this, which I'm really excited about. Um, so we're very grateful to them and all of their generosity over the years. Um, maybe the most honest way of talking about our work is to frame the discussion around our method. Um, we use an approach to poetry or expressive writing that takes root from a tradition started by Kenneth Koch and Robert Haas when they were serving as guest poets in New York City public schools. From the beginning, their work emphasized 
uh, challenging students with contemporary texts and focusing on responding to work instead of interpreting it. And I think that's a great way to like engage with what Marilyn Singer is doing in her poetry. Um, in this way, it becomes a way of flipping the script. It makes the process focus on generating new work as a response to existing work. Uh, it becomes about a poetry idea that encourages students to write. Um, in my experience, this achieves a quality of understanding of difficult texts that's the same as we get to after careful explication and interpretation. It's just a different path to the same sorts of learning objectives, but it's one that truly centers student voices and their own experiences and validates those. Um, so I'll give you an outline of the, the sort of six steps in our method, um, and then we'll talk about how we can apply it to, to these conversations. We always begin with the poetry idea and in, in introducing that. So I encourage our teaching artists to work the idea up with a creative introduction. I ask them to model curiosity, to tell a story, to bring in a prop, a visual or an audio element and perform for the writers that we're working with. Uh, and that leads to a discussion of the poem's big ideas. For example, we're gonna talk today about um, persona poems and uh, odes that celebrate objects. Um, and so one could bring in their own sentimental object, their own visual aid that helps them talk about the sort of emotional and historical narratives that are contained in an object. Or if we're you know, talking about a persona poem to a first lady or a related figure, you can bring in a photo, or as we have here, some letters in their own voices. Uh, all of these things help us have a conversation about the ideas in the air. Um, and that will lead us then to the next part of the method, which is a model poem. Um, that's where the big idea comes from, whether here it's persona or an object ode. Um, sometimes even two models can help students see different possibilities in, in the conversation. And I think that's great. In our packet here, there are two very different persona poems that complement the work that Marilyn Singer is doing with her poetry. And I think that um, one is by Adrian Matika um, and the other is by Greg Santos. And they're just really different playful approaches to persona. I don't think you could find two more different poems actually. And I love that my colleague Jessica pulled those together. Um, I do encourage uh, teachers and our teaching artists as they're coming up with a creative lesson like this that is really energetic and performative to write their own response to the prompt, to write their own persona poem, to write their own object ode. It may be something that they share to help their students get unstuck or started, um, but it's also a worthwhile activity to understand where the sort of transitions through the lesson need to be uh, directive or suggestive. Um, sometimes I share mine, sometimes I don't. Um, but after we've shared that model poem, gotten people excited about the idea, we usually take a moment and we call this, these steps are all called charging the air to get a couple of lines written together. Um, so we want everyone's voice in the air. We want to hear from people and we want to get a couple of ideas down. Um, so you may in this, these examples, write towards a specific figure together or write about a specific object together and get some sensory details, get some historical facts together. Um, and then people begin to see what's possible. Once you've written together, it becomes very easy for people. If you do it right, they're almost so excited to write that you can't stop them. And that makes the writing alone, the anxiety of the blank page much easier to get over. And then the last step after they've had, you know, 10 to 15 minutes to write alone, is to share. And that's where you get to, you know, sort of hear what happened in that constructive time. Um, so that's our method. We move from the poetry idea and introduction to a model poem, to writing together, writing alone, and sharing. Um, oh, went the wrong direction. <laughs> so in the toolkit, and I've hinted at this a little bit, are a couple of different approaches. Uh, the first are these persona poems. Um, and I think these are, what I like about persona is that it's an act of empathy. It's a way of connecting across uh, gender barriers, across time, across class, across everything to sort of not describe a person or write about a person, but to write in their voice from their perspective. Um, the, the word persona actually comes from the Latin word, which means a mask. Um, so you kind of put on the mask of this person as an you know, an ancient Greek dramatist would and give their monologue. And so it's a way um, that we step away from our own eye in our writing and we get to reflect uh, somebody else's. We get to engage our, uh, our 
our imaginations a little bit more. We get to use vernacular maybe of a different time or vocabulary of a different time. Um, maybe we have a sense of how that person speaks. One of the models here actually is in the, the voice of the Incredible Hulk. And so uh, it's such a playful way to illustrate the possibilities of that. Um, and Marilyn Singer's poems do this, you know, in, in a very, you know, a different way than the Incredible Hulk. And I think they're really generous ways of engaging with these important figures. Um, but the, you know, a, as you're writing these, it kind of becomes a kind of rhetoric. You begin to um, bring voices and stories to the forefront that maybe haven't been attended to or maybe been lost a little bit in our dominant conversations and cultural narrative. And so these become a really interesting ideal to explore the lives of you know, some of these, these fascinating political figures, our first ladies. Um, so the two poems here, I won't read them, uh, but they're in our packet. One is um, about Jack Johnson, who was uh, a prize fighter. He was the first uh, African-American heavyweight boxing champion. And then the second is um, uh, Gregory Santos's poem in the voice of the Hulk. Um, but I think there are questions that we can ask about these poems. And one is, what happens when you write in their voice instead of about them? Uh, and the other figures that emerge, Jack Johnson's wife, Etta, is prominent in the poem. You know, instead of writing about her, we see her for, through his eyes. And I think that's a really powerful uh, emotional vehicle here in the poems. And I, I think that's one of the things that persona allows us to do. Um, with the Hulk poem, which is beautifully titled Hulk Smash, we get you know, just this unique vernacular, the grammar of Hulk No, you know, the sort of uh, broken syntax in, in um, persona of that character, the incorrect use of verbs. And I think it's a really playful one. Now, I don't believe that Lady Bird Johnson has anything in common vernacular wise with the Hulk, but we can begin to sort of, you know, see the, the possibilities here. Um, and what we've done to make, the, to make the leap from these examples to those is provided uh, or with Allison's help curated uh, a collection of, you know, short biographies from a number of first ladies and first lady adjacent figures from um, the first ladies, Lou Hoover, Michelle Obama, Eleanor Roosevelt, Ida McKinley, Lady Bird Johnson, and Dolly Madison. Um, also, we have some pictures, <laughs> uh, Mary Lincoln and Jackie Kennedy. And then one of the things that I'm really excited about is the non-first ladies, the sort of figures who are adjacent to these stories and narratives that give us perhaps a different perspective and allow us to, um, you know, diversify the conversation in some important ways, be more inclusive uh, and take a broader view. Um, and those, you know, those voices include Elizabeth Keckley, Alice Roosevelt, Anne Lowe, um, and they're just really, really fascinating figures, and Polly Murray, um, and one of the things that we hope happens is as a person is looking at these figures, that they kind of go down that rabbit hole of curiosity and try to find out more about, about these stories um, that aren't as centered in our conversations as they ought to be. Um, and I think this collection of short bios really gives us uh, quite a bit to do. Um, the next sort of set, so yeah, these are some of the figures here. Um, and I do think they're really remarkable figures from dressmakers to the first black female priest in the Episcopal Church. I think there's just some incredible opportunities to engage in experiences that are different from ours. And maybe that's where persona offers us something truly unique is we're not obsessing or being anxious over our own lives, our own experience, our own daily turmoil, but we get to inhabit that other person and see theirs. And there's a commonality in that. Um, and so I'm really excited about what these prompts can do. Um, and yeah, Jessica Jewell in our office has put together a really nice way of thinking about some of these. The next opportunity that we have are these object odes. Um, and this is blackout poetry or erasure poetry. When we do a digital version of it, we call it emerge. So you, I'll use those terms uh, interchangeably. It's, you know, hundred, hundreds of years old practice of working with somebody else's voice, somebody else's text as a starting point for reflection and changing them. Um, there's something subversive about this. There's something playful about this. Um, but educationally, I like that it always begins with a close reading of a primary text. And then you enter into a conversation. In it. And by giving students uh, permission to draw on that text, write on that text, deface that text, um, 
there's all kinds of opportunities that present themselves. One, um, one is uh, that, this is skipping a little bit. One is that, oh, stop it. <laughs> um, all right, yeah, one is that they might amplify a meaning and the other is that they subvert. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I'll come back to the blackout poetry in just a little bit. Um, with our object odes, we get to do something a little bit different and that's focus on perhaps things in the collection, perhaps artifacts that students can engage with, um, perhaps you know, other digital materials and resources. Um, but an ode is a celebratory poem. It's a, originally they were sung, right? They were um, something that would be performed in public as a way of honoring something. They often focus on a single idea, person or object. And the way we've decided to do this here is to focus on objects in this. Um, one of the things that I think makes contemporary odes stand out is the way that they're really rich in sensory details. They start with textures, um, they embrace smell, they have taste and sounds and images, and those become ways, powerful ways of engaging us as readers, as audiences. Um, so in this lesson, what we encourage people to, if you're, if you're the presenter, bring in an object of your own that has sentimental value um, and tell that story. Introduce this idea of celebrating an object. Uh, alternatively, you could certainly use something from the historic site as an example, uh, which is something that will mirror the sort of final prompt of this. Um, but we always begin, I think, with those five senses, with those details. Um, you know, what do you see? What does it feel like if you have something you're able to touch? You know, what, is you, what do you imagine it feels like? What sounds can you imagine accompanying the object? Um, you know, how might you describe what it would like to be like to touch the object? Would it be warm or cold? Is it soft or rough? Um, you know, who was around the object? Who did it touch? What did it see? What did it witness? Who interacted with it? Um, and then we can imbue these objects with memory. You know, what stories can the object tell, real or imagined? What might it remember if it had a memory? Um, and the model poem here, I'll share a little bit of it, is Jan Beatty. Um, it's a poem that celebrates objects that probably we wouldn't find in a museum, but the details are just are just gorgeous. Um, and I think it gives an emotional force to the poems. So she talks about her father's t-shirts. Um, and she starts by saying, I keep my father's t-shirts in a brown paper bag in the hall between the bathroom and the bedroom. Uh, and so she starts there by describing where they are. And then she goes on and describing these sort of like cheap t-shirts with slightly humorous sayings on them. Um, and it's clear that there's sort of some tension in the family, um, but then the ends really beautifully. She says, they seem to smell like him, a smell I carry with me now. I couldn't give them to the Salvation Army with the eight bags of his suits and shoes, his blue and white striped Bermuda shorts, and his gum shoes that I always thought looked silly. So I leave them in the hall. I greet them as I walk into my apartment maybe with just a glance, or maybe I stare for a few seconds, sometimes at night when I can't sleep. I go to the bag and sort through them, hold them to my face and say, hello. And I just love that idea of everything an object might symbolize to us. And it's such a skillful poem because of the details and the imagery that she uses. Um, and so the kind of discussion I would have with students is, you know, what, what gets their attention in this poem? Where do they feel most connected to it? And then I would ask them, do they have objects like this in their life? Um, and ask them to tell those stories. And then the prompt is very simple here. We ask people to find an object and celebrate it. Um, they might begin with description by exploring those senses, but we want them to move into emotion and see the object in the world that it moved through or existed in. And there's uh, a series of sentence stems that we have to get them started. What does it know? What does the object know? What does it carry the smell of? What does the object remember? What did the object see? When you touch it, what do you feel? What do you think of? And those sorts of stems can help students build momentum, get some ideas down on the page and sort of keep the poem flowing. Um, but I'd be really excited to see this put, put to work um, at, the, at the National Historic Site. Um, and now, back to what I was getting very excited about earlier, is this practice of blackout or erasure poetry. Um, you know, it asks us to begin with these primary texts. I mentioned that as students do this work, they can amplify or subvert the original intentions. Um, 
things that students will respond to in this is, yes, it is kind of an act of vandalism that they, they often enjoy, um, but there's also this creative constraint of being limited to someone else's language um, that will frustrate people in a good way. Um, they it's a puzzle to solve, it's a problem to solve. Um, and so being tied to that language and the sequence of words, um, you know, really makes them work, makes them think, makes them process. I've seen students work on this, um, you know, one page sort of erasure poem, 20, 30 minutes, just trying to get, get it right, get it to do what they want it to do. Um, but there's also the added benefit with the persona poem, at some point you have to face that blank white page. You have to face those lines where you need to put your own ideas down. Um, and with blackout or erasure poetry or an emerge tool that, the anxiety of the blank page is gone. You've got language existing there and you're sort of in control of creating it. Um, I usually, I'll show some examples here in a second, um, but tips that I give writers when they're working it is as they're reading through it, as they're doing that close reading, um, mark words that stand out to them. Don't worry about syntax or grammar as you're sort of crafting your poem. Um, and I think some of the most effective examples of this, writers use very few words. Um, so Allison has helped collect a series of texts that tell the stories of First Lady as they're in the packet. And it's such a rich collection. Um, you know, there, there's letters, and I'll, I'll just skip to my favorite one because I think it's great. Um, so if the presentation catches up. Um, I love there's this exchange between Marge Simpson, of all people, um, and Barbara Bush. Um, and so I took Marge's letter here and respond, you know, and did an erasure of it. Um, and it was, it was, I get to do this all the time. It's playful and it's part of my job and I'm very lucky. Um, but you can see side by side the original and then my erasure poem, which reads, Mrs. First Bush. I read your criticism, I hurt. We are a wee bit short of normal, but a person is a person. I try, it's hard. The country calls us the dumbest thing. In my heart, each of us is good. Um, so I, I love the way that it kind of distills and amplifies uh, Marge's very thoughtful letter. And I like that in reality that Barbara Bush responded to, to um, the Simpsons letter, which I think is a really, um, wonderful true thing that happened. Um, so there, there's quite a bit of other material to work with. Um, and many of them are in the, the handwriting uh, of the original author, which I think is great. Um, there's a letter to, to Mrs. Hoover. Um, there's just some really, really great materials. And I think there's something um, great about being able to interact with these documents in this way. Um, what I'll do now is show just a couple of examples. You know, we hope that this is the beginning of a collaboration and I want to show what these things can look like um, when they are um, in our digital format. So I'll pull that up quickly um, and show some of the other projects here. And then we should have some time for, plenty of time for some questions. So this is our travelingstanzas.com website. And here you can see how we've applied these same tools to a lot of different projects. Currently, we've been running um, one of our recent first book authors, uh, Julia Koczynski dasbach was born in Ukraine. And we collaborated with her to do a project to allow people to speak out to what is happening in Ukraine. And so that's our Dear Ukraine project. For any of these, you can click on them, contribute to that sort of um, the poem prompt when we open it up as a community poem, we call that thread. Uh, and then Emerge, our digital tool, exists for a lot of these too. Um, but we have a number of projects here on different themes. Uh, and I'll just show an example that gives us a lot of uh, examples. We did one on the vaccine. Sacred Breath is a project um, supporting Ohio nurses during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I'll scroll through a couple of these, and then we'll go back and maybe look at the Cuyahoga Valley one. I think it shows a lot of the details pretty well. The Global Peace Poem is a great example of our community poems. Armed With Our Voices was a project honoring the 50th anniversary of the shooting on our campus on May 4th, 1970. Um, Poets for Science is a big collaboration with the poet Jane Hirschfield. Um, 
And there are many, many more. So I invite you to scroll through some of these, add your voice to any of the galleries, create um, blackout or emerge poetry um, and have fun. <laughs> but I'll show you what they can look like in that digital format with this toolkit. Um, this was created for Cuyahoga Valley. Um, and there are these two elements. Thread is the community poem where people can explore a theme uh, and add their voice to it. So we could do this with the persona poems. We could do this with, um, with the uh, object poems. Uh, we targeted these three themes that were their programming themes for that year. And so the geology thread goes like this, where people are responding to Charles Simic's poem. Uh, we'll actually just skip to the gallery. You sort of get that same walkthrough that I just gave you. Um, but they were responding to Charles Simic's poem, Stone. There's a number of like simple stems to get them started. And then everything turns up in a community response page where you can see all of these lines. So uh, my stone watches the valley change over the year. Inside the stone, I felt protected. My stone is welcoming to others, part of the protecting circle. Um, these look like the students at Old Trail have really been enjoying it lately, um, but we've got submissions from all around. This is a very local project, so that's normal. The Global Peace Poem, we have submissions from all over the world. Uh, I saw dark wet rocks by the stream and fuzzy green moss, the song of a bird, a cracking stick, and joyous laughter of the kids. Wow, there's such good lines. Um, so that's how the individual prompts can work out in a community sense. Uh, and then I will go back to the eMERGE text, which shows the, black, the digital version of that blackout tool. Um, so we'll stick with the geology theme. There are texts here that are um, written about the Cuyahoga River or the valley or the different geology of the region in the different ways and from different eras, you know, from 1933 to a geologic US uh, GS survey from 2021, um, this more poetic novel about the river called The Sculptor. But whichever text you select, you're able to sort of scroll through, do a close read, and then decide like where you want to make a poem by clipping a section. Um, and then it loads this poem builder. And then you click the words you want and everything fades out. Immediately she poured by its shores, etc. added them <laughs> to the accumulation. So, and then you can decide how much of the other text exists. You can save it and send it on to the gallery. Um, but these tools, uh, what I like about them is, although my favorite thing to do is deliver in-person workshops and have that powerful interaction with people, these tools expand our access. They allow more people to play with them. Um, they, they're able to reach more individuals, be in more classrooms than me or my teaching artists are able to do. Um, but that is an introduction to both this project and some of our other digital elements. Um, and now I guess I, we can turn it over so, for some questions. I have a question for you. I know our um, rangers at National First Ladies Historic Site have been um, undergone some training with you all, and they've been doing the blackout poetry. So as we are kind of building around um, the, the curriculum that you've provided with us, we'll definitely share and work with them to share some of the pieces that are um, at our site on mm -hmm. display that have already been created. Um, but I like that because it's so approachable but but from a and from a social studies teacher viewpoint, it's a really different approach to thinking about a primary text because um, you're not and and I guess with a poem too. Sometimes we ask our students to read poems or to read a text and analyze it. But here you were like taking it and processing it a new way and creating it into something new. So I, I wanted to talk about that from an educator point of view, because yeah. um, sometimes that's so different than what mm -hmm. we're expected to do in the classroom. And I, I think it's especially a challenge for teachers who have like a set curriculum, like I teach social studies or I work with science. Yeah. Um, how do you encourage teachers who aren't traditionally 
um, working in the arts to get creative and to feel comfortable approaching? And how do you get that cross-curricular um, conversation going throughout schools? That's, I think that's such an important question. And that's one that um, I think we answer in a couple of different ways. But, you know, we're, many of us are bound in different ways to different learning objectives or standards that we, you know, that you have to meet in the classroom. And we know as coming in as guests, there's one way that we could be disruptive and ignore those and give everyone a really powerful, creative experience. Um, but I don't think that's really what we do. I think what we do is shift the emphasis. So you're responding first to the work of art emotionally, which is why the artist made it, right? Like if the goal is to understand complex texts, asking why Jan Beatty wrote that poem about her father's t-shirts is as good a question as any interpretive or evaluative sort of question, or even a formal question about meter or the, the structure of a poem, but asking how does that make you feel? How does this, how effective is this poem at connecting to you emotionally will eventually get you to that same understanding. Um, if we sort of prepare the right questions or, or help guide our reader's attention to certain key parts of the poem. Um, but I, what we end up doing is understanding why you know, some of the context, some of the things that would maybe inspired a person to write the piece in the first place. And then we can talk about those other things, which gets us to the same place. You know, it's like, even when we're talking about formal poetry, like, you know, we're taught a sonnet is 14 lines. We're taught sort of different approaches to rhyme scheme and meter that exist in sonnets over time. Um, but that's not our method. Our method is to say, well, why 14 lines? You know, what is it about that? And there's an idea that, um, you know, some, I wish I had the exact quote ready, but that 14 lines is about the right amount of space to really think about an idea and turn it over on its head once. And so if you think that like a sonnet is a kind of condensed form to really carefully explore one idea, that's a lot more meaningful of an understanding than that it has 14 lines and may or may not be an iambic pentameter and have a certain rhyme scheme. Now we know why that form exists. Um, and then we can add those other elements to our understanding. Um, so I think it's a shifting of emphasis and I think it's an important one. I don't expect um, the learning standards to shift to match this, but I think it makes us better, more empathetic readers, um, which then can serve those other objectives pretty well. It makes us more exciting to read, more excited to read, more excited to engage. And it also allows us to connect our own lived, lived experiences to these texts, to these stories, to these figures, to these voices. And that becomes something that stays with us, right? <laughs> Beyond the whatever the next round of testing is. And, and so often with um, literature or reading classes, there's a focus on nonfiction and mm -hmm. um, reading about some of these figures that we've talked about, although um, we focus on women and some of those women aren't really well represented in, mm -hmm. in a classroom setting, but when we focus on history, it's it's reading for facts. Um, and, and when you're approaching it this way, you're kind of letting go of some of that and, and thinking about stepping in that person's shoes and and mm -hmm. having that experience too which is really nice yeah and I, you know there's a caution that I feel with that too you know especially with the blackout poetry because we are talking about voices that maybe haven't been heard and yeah. there is a way to read that activity as silencing them I mm -hmm. you know I think a lot of times in these contexts it's play and maybe that's why I chose to work with Marge Simpson's letter because she's not real, um, but, you know, because I didn't maybe feel as comfortable sort of manipulating the words of some of the first ladies, but I do like that the first step is a close empathetic reading, you know, um, but I also think that like we can find things that really resonate in their letters and in their stories and things that we maybe do want to argue with, and I think that's, that's okay too. Um, and so, so I do think it, it works and it's okay, but there are certain applications of that particular poetic practice that I, I like to be careful about. That's a good point. And so, so often when we started seeing it at the site, it was like, well, this reminds me of like some of the presidential pieces that are redacted. Mm -hmm. So like, like if you're the, you know, um, secret service agent or the person at the state department, like crossing things out, there is almost a connection. Yeah. Um, there. There 
There definitely is. You know, two very prominent, well, one very prominent recent example is Tracy K. Smith, who did an erasure poem of the Declaration of Independence, you know, in a really provocative and skillful way. Um, there was a writer I worked with a, a while ago who did did one of the 9-11 commission report, you know, which is um, already, you know, so there's already those layers of redaction and things like that. And he was playing with that from uh, Travis McDonald. It was a really fascinating project. Um, yeah, there's a lot of really interesting examples. And I like then that our ge the gesture of our actions has consequence, has meaning, has symbolism. And that's something that we can talk about too. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. We have, um, I think one of the letters, I'll have to put it up on the wake up. We can talk about mm -hmm. how people can find the resources, but we have an exhibition up at the um, First Ladies Historic Site right now related mm -hmm. to Nancy Reagan. And one of the issues that we've um, been having conversations with people and especially having students think about is um, some of the social issues of the time period. So mm -hmm. Nancy Reagan's uh, Just Say No campaign. And one of the letters we came up with was from a girl who um, wrote to Nancy Reagan and said, I don't do drugs. None of my friends do drugs. And based on this campaign, I'm getting this feeling that that you think that we're all involved or have all been exposed to drugs. And that's not my experience. So I mm -hmm. think um, hearing from other people that aren't the important people or hearing the feedback and getting to look at those primary sources and manipulate them and reflect on them is really great too. Yeah, and we hadn't talked about adding perhaps another mode to this conversation, which is epistolary form, letter form. So yeah. right, not, writing not in the voices of these figures, but to them. Um, mm -hmm. which is a way like, like that young person did, who's probably my age right now, um, you know, to Nancy Reagan, like, you know, if we sort of erase the barrier of time and say like, what might you write to, what might you say to somebody even, you know, uh, well, you know, Jackie Kennedy pops to mind, like such, you know, a fascinating figure in a person that like, we have such deep empathy for because of what she endured. Um, and so there are opportunities and moments in these lives, um, you know, uh, or even, you know, Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt's involvement with the Declaration of uh, Human Rights, uh, the UN Declaration of Human Rights, like to, um, to respond to some of those uh, incredible moments in these stories, like as a fan or, a, or in, in a conversation, as a critique, I think that's another opportunity here that uh, is certainly worth exploring. Um, I think it'd be very interesting. So what kinds of, um, when you have students approach a blank page and just sort of freak out about it, how, how, what do you do? That's a great question. I think the first thing is you give them permission. Um, they'll, they'll say, I don't know what to write. Um, and, but if you ask them, well, you know, what are you thinking about? You know, what did you, what did you, what was interesting to you about this? What, what are you feeling? Like, what do you want to say? And you can even just give them permission to say like, well, I'm not feeling any connection to this person. And you say, well, start mm -hmm. there. Tell us why. Mm -hmm. Say why you don't feel a connection to that person. And once you grant them that permission, they're going to, the idea will change in that 10, 15 minutes of writing time. Um, even, you know, I, I spend a lot of time in fourth and fifth grade classrooms as well as uh, other age groups. Oftentimes they'll want to start with a joke. They'll want to say something funny. That's fine because that's one line and now their pencil is moving. And then you have to say, well, now show me something else. Like, what else can you come up with? So can you do better than that? Um, and so I never think about telling them not to do something or they must do it a certain way, but I try to meet them where they're at or try to get them to articulate what their barriers to it are. I was working with a pre-service teacher yesterday and we were working on this poem about place. It was a it was another ode. It was an apartment building ode. Um, and there's something about the tone of the author that this pre-service teacher didn't like. And so he wrote a, a poem that was a critique of celebrating the building in the way that this, in the, in the community that this author was. But then he ended up celebrating his place in a very different way, equally poetic and beautiful, talking about the texture of the shingles on the roof and the siding and the color of the like evening sun on it. And so, he started from that negative place from like, I don't know about this activity. I don't know if I want to do it. Um, and then got to a place where he celebrated the thing he wanted to. And it was just as valid a poem as the model we were working with. Um, and so I tend to encourage people 
if they're feeling that like resistance to the activity to embrace that and to go with it. Um, I think a lot of this work is about permission. Um, and when you then get to that sharing at the end, you usually find that was the right call. Um, maybe you get in an appropriate joke and everyone laughs, but that's not the end of the world either. So. How do you encourage students to share when they finish? Yeah, that is a hard thing. Um, if I'm working with a group over, you know, four or six weeks, they start to get more comfortable with the process. They start to get more comfortable with me and they will. Um, but that first one is hard. And so I usually say, I don't want to force anyone because that could be harmful. So I say, hey, if you want to read your whole poem, I would love to hear it. If not, how about just a line? If you're feeling really shy today, just tell me and we'll skip that. Or if you want me to read your poem, I'll read it for you. And so we give them those three options, go around the room. Uh, and then the first week, it depends on the group and the culture of the classroom that we're in or the culture of the community that we're working with. And then the next week, more people want to share because they are excited by what they heard the previous week. But if you're just doing this once, um, I think it's important to do it with a delicate touch. You don't want to, you don't want somebody to feel bullied into sharing, but you can maybe like, like happily ask them into sharing um, mm -hmm. if that works. Yeah. So as far as the, um, resources we've been discussing. Mm -hmm. I know we'll send out a link to everyone who's participating. And as we post this to YouTube and share it out further with the National First Ladies Library Wakelet page, which has a number of curriculum resources and some of these letters, um, and then your packet, mm -hmm. how do they connect also with WIC poetry? Um, yeah. That's a great question because, you know, depending on our availability, we can come out and do lessons if that's helpful to folks, um, mm -hmm. you know, we're not too far away. Um, and, and we can, you know, talk about other examples, but I would say, you know, go to the traveling stanzas website that I had up and go to the contact us page and if you send uh, anything to the WIC poetry at kent.edu email address will will reply. Um, we're pretty quick about it. Uh, if you want to reach out to me directly, I'm CJ Malone at Kent.edu, and my information's on the uh, official WIC poetry um, page on the university website, which is just kent.edu slash WIC, and you can find us there. Um, That's great. Um, and I do want to mention that the National First Ladies Library has a number of teaching objects and um, objects related to First Ladies. We have some really great yeah. suitcases with artifacts that students can touch and interact with, from um, teacups to um, campaign buttons to old um, copies of magazines to um, a camera similar to what Jackie Kennedy would have used when she was a Girl Friday photographer for a newspaper. So um, we're always happy to connect you with some of those really cool objects. Um, some of them are very mysterious, like invalid feeders mm -hmm. um, that people in the 19th century might have used that are like kind of sick um, hospital bed sippy cups. So they make for great uh, prompts and, and descriptors too. So um, you can always connect with me at the National First Ladies Library if you're interested in some um, curriculum connections or resources related to women in history as well. Yeah, such an incredible resource. Yeah. So, um, Charlie, I want to thank you so much for telling us a little bit more about WIC and walking us through these activities. And again, we're going to push these activity prompts and resources out to everybody who registered, um, people who haven't seen this and may connect with it in the future as they're uh, registering for the larger uh, student event. But I want to thank you for joining us and for sharing um, some of your uh, teaching tips and experiences. Our pleasure. Thank you, Allison. Well, thank you so much. And again, um, head to the um, National First Ladies Library Wake Up page to get the curriculum. We'll send out a link to everyone who participated today um, and our event page to get uh, registered for that Have You Heard Lady Bird? 
um, and getting a curriculum kit in the mail for me soon. So thank you so much. And um, thanks for tuning in and have a great evening. Thanks so much.